A few months ago, I asked my followers on Twitter what was the most important experiment ever done. More than a dozen people replied almost instantly the famous Madame Wu parody violation experiment. And today, I'm going to tell you why I agree with them. Come along on this ride into the impossible. Any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. You may be familiar with the concept of parity, the state or condition of being equal regarding status or pay. Today, sadly, we're going to talk about one famous scientist's failure to achieve parity with her male counterparts. More on that later. One of the most perplexing concepts in quantum mechanics is Heisenberg's uncertainty principle. The fact that the more you know about one property of a chunk of matter, the less you know about a corresponding property, a complementary property, such as position and momentum. Imagine you're in a dark room. You are told that a ping pong ball is rolling around on the floor. You can find it and know exactly where it is, but you lose all notion of what is its velocity. Those two properties, position and momentum, are complementary in particle physics as well. There's another property called spin, which is a consequence of angular momentum of subatomic particles. And it's impossible to know simultaneously the spin along two different axes that are orthogonal to one another at the same time. We know a lot about motion in the universe, and one of the most common features of motion is rotation. The rotation of planets, the rotation of the Earth, uh, for example, around the Sun, the Moon around the Earth, the Earth and Sun around the galactic center, the galaxy with motion around the local group of clusters center of mass. And we all know that the motion of matter is caused by a central potential, an attractive force caused by the mass or matter of that dynamical system. And as long as it's conservative, as long as it's not emitting energy, Emmy Noether and her famous theorem in the 1900s described a conservation law that all conservation laws were associated with symmetries. So the conservation of angular momentum results in the symmetry, the non-change of an object as it moves in space. The conservation law, conservation of angular momentum, is associated with symmetry under rotation. So at the smallest scales, too, we know that atoms are always in motion. Before we even knew about atoms, Ludwig Boltzmann predicted that their motion would result in the property that we call temperature and also the property of entropy, which we've explored in many videos on this channel. Later, Albert Einstein explained the motion known as Brownian motion with the kinetic theory of molecules and established for the first time that molecules existed. By the end of the 19th century, it was known that electrons existed. And it was even believed that protons existed at the core of atoms, as shown by uh, Rutherford in his famous plum pudding model. And later, Bohr and others developed the atomic hypothesis and the laws of atomic motion and transitions, where electrons were kind of like a mini planetary system. We now know that that's wrong. But Bohr nevertheless won a Nobel Prize for that effort. And the transitions between different orbitals, a principal quantum number, symbolized by the letter lowercase n, to higher levels and back and forth and so forth, were associated with the emission or absorption of quanta of light. Quanta discovered and predicted by Max Planck and in the famous constant h bar h that bears his name. The quantum revolution soon after revealed the relationships between fundamental forces of, of nature and their properties as they extend throughout long or short ranges. So gravity acts over the largest possible scales in the universe, governing the universe itself, but it's the weakest force by many, many orders of magnitude compared to electromagnetism and the two nuclear forces, the strong nuclear force uh, that is governing the attraction and repulsion of atomic nuclei and how they bind together. The weak nuclear force is responsible for radioactive decay and fusion and, fu and fission and the processes that keep our sun illuminated. So these were discovered throughout the 30s, 40s, and 50s, and it was conjectured that these laws, too, in quantum mechanics would also obey the symmetry properties, namely symmetry under rotation, of the classical mechanical laws of planets and orbiting uh, stars, etc., in our universe. But physicists, being careful observers and careful never to trust their intuition alone, devised very precise experiments. In the 1950s, at the National Bureau of Standards in Washington, D.C., the uh, first precision test of whether or not you could have 
symmetries that we obey, believe to be obeyed in classical mechanics, whether or not those would adhere and apply at the quantum level. Those were proposed to be tested. And atom smashers, cyclotrons, and, and, and synchrotrons were developed, smashed them together, and a lot of conservation laws were found to be sacrosanct. In other words, conservation of linear momentum, conservation of energy, and even uh, conjectured the uh, existence of the neutrino by Wolfgang Pauli in the 1930s was done to s save conservation of energy. That's how sacrosanct it was. Now, another law of nature is the symmetry under mirror reflections. The fact that if you look at a pendulum swinging back and forth in a mirror, it looks the same as if you look at it directly without a mirror. So that is a property known as parity conservation. And if classical laws held at the quantum level, then the mirror image of a physical system, say a nucleus, should behave as the same exact way as its direct image, as looking at it directly, not in a mirror. One such property would be the spin or polarity of the emission of, uh, of the electron during the process known as beta decay. It was taken for granted that the physics of elementary particles would behave the same way as pendula. But was that true? And in fact, two physicists, Frank Yang and T.D. Lee, in, the in 1955 and 56, worked on a proposal that suggested perhaps physicists should look more carefully. They were theorists. Nothing against theorists. But they were theorists, and they conjectured that perhaps the weak nuclear force responsible for beta decay would not obey the law of parity conservation. So CN, or Frank Yang, and T.D. Tsung Dao Lee proposed that this should be looked after. And one of their colleagues took up the challenge. In fact, she did so during her Christmas break in the winter of 1956. And thanks to her, we received as physicists, as uh, scientists, a wonderful present that we could scarcely have imagined without her work. So she decided to test the proposal, and she devised an ingenious experiment involving an isotope of the element cobalt, which could be envisioned as a spinning top, spinning around, and that spinning top would then be polarized, magnetically polarized, to point in one direction, and then it would decay because it's subject to the weak nuclear force, and the weak nuclear force features beta decay, beta rays or electrons. They would shoot out in one direction or another. What she found is that the direction of the emission did not depend on whether or not you were looking at this in a mirror or not. Namely, if you reverse the direction of spin of the cobalt nucleus, you still got the same shoot-off direction of the beta ray or the electron rays. So she saw this as a chance to make history and verify the predictions of her colleagues, C.N. Yang and T.D. Lee. Reading from uh, my friend Stefan Alexander's book, uh, Fear of a Black Universe, past guest on the Into the Impossible podcast. There is another symmetry between the electron field and the photon that also has to be violated. It's called CP violation, for C for charge and P for parity. This symmetry is similar to a mirror reflection. When you look in the mirror, there's a spatial reflection that inverts left and right. Your left hand looks like your right hand under a mirror reflection. We can imagine the CP inversion as a type of mirror that reflects the charge and orientation of the electron simultaneously. A spinning particle like the cobalt-60 nucleus, under a CP inversion, sees itself looking like its antiparticle, the positron with its spin reversed, or an anti-cobalt-60 nucleus, if you could imagine such a thing. So if we want to create matter over antimatter, this CP symmetry would have to be violated. And he relates it to one of the so-called Sakharov conditions that we'll talk about in a future video. Wu's brilliant experiment measured the directional properties of beta decay in cobalt-60. And this weak nuclear force was thought originally to be parity symmetric, according to most physicists before Li and Yang. But Wu set out to prove if that was really true. Her results turned physics upside down. Or maybe flipped it in a mirror, a better way to think about it. <laughs> Wu demonstrated that parity was not conserved, and the universe, therefore, has a parity preference. And an exact mirror universe could not exist. Her paper was published in 1956. And it was confirmed by others, such as Leon Letterman, also at Columbia University. And it took the field of physics by storm, leading to Nobel Prizes, but not for Madame Wu. Unfortunately, she was left out of the 1957 Nobel Prize, and it did go to T.D. Lee and C.N. Yang. Uh, and they deserved it, certainly, but so did she. And in fact, there was a slot, an open slot, since the Nobel Committee rules, that arbitrary organization, has a rule that three people could win it, even though Alfred Nobel said only one person could win it. Nevertheless, they could have given it to three people, including uh, Chin Seng Wu, but she never won it. 
She's been called many, many wonderful accolades, including the First Lady of Physics, the Chinese Madame Curie, and many other accolades. She was just this year, 2021, awarded a U.S. Postal Service stamp in her honor, forever stamp, which she certainly deserves. But many think she lost out on the main prize that she did deserve, the Nobel Prize. She never fretted about it. She never complained about it. And her storied career also included work on the Manhattan Project before this apocal 1956 experiment that confirmed that our universe is more twisted than we could have ever thought. Only four women have ever won Nobel Prizes. Marie Curie, UC San Diego's own Maria Gephardt Mayer, Andrea Ghez in 2020, and Donna Strickland in 2018. Women are still woefully underrepresented, as I talk about in my book, Losing the Nobel Prize, and, uh, and continue to do so, unfortunately, to the detriment, I think, of the history of physics, if nothing else. History is often taught in physics by who won a Nobel Prize. And I urge you to look in any popular account of physics, how many times the Nobel Prize is mentioned. So-and-so won it for this discovery, et cetera, et cetera. So it's become sort of the sacred cow, and I've talked a lot about that. So not only is parity conservation violated in physics, sometimes it is in the Nobel Awards as well, and we have other symmetries, which may also appear in the twisted arrangement of life itself, of the DNA molecule, as we discussed in this video over here. Why is DNA twisted? And that may be a fundamental symmetry, or it may be a byproduct of life, that the universe on both the weak nuclear force and the strong nuclear force exhibits parity violation, CP violation, and not this other violation that could also be concomitant called CPT violation. We'll talk about that later. The question that is most delightful, perhaps, to think about is whether or not the entire universe could exhibit some form of parity violation and concomitant with that a form of what's known as Lorentz violation, invariance of the Lorentz transform, which underpins all of modern physics, starting from special relativity and general relativity and far, far beyond. So stay tuned for future videos about those fascinating topics. For now, leave a comment. Do you think Madame Wu missed out on a Nobel Prize that she deserved? Make sure to like, comment, and subscribe to this channel, and hit the notification bell so you never miss an episode. I plan to do many more of these 30-minute thesis episodes, including uh, deep dives into the essence of particle physics, of cosmology, of experimental physics, and beyond. And I'll also continue to provide you with interviews in-depth with the greatest thinkers in all of science and uh, philosophy, even religion, and even in leadership on my Tuesday deep dive interviews. So for now, I thank you for going into the impossible and stay tuned for more great content. If you like this video, click here for a discussion of CP violation in cosmology with Sean Carroll, or watch this video with one of my scientist friends. Don't forget to subscribe.